today, uh, this talk uh, is going to be, actually I'm only going to talk a little bit about it, but I actually have a poster on Bohemian eigenvalues as well. So tomorrow night you'll see a big poster produced with images like this one. This of course is a familiar image to you because the image is on the conference poster. The image was prepared by my PhD student, Stephen Thornton, and I really like it. It's one of, the, one of my favorite pictures. We actually have it up on the art wall on the second floor. If you go up to the second floor to visit a flight map, you will see that this and several other ones. The image on the back of the t-shirts. Uh, David, my lovely assistant, if you would stand up and show the t-shirt. So there we go. <laughs> uh, everybody should have got uh, a t-shirt. You all have a title to t-shirt. When they... When <laughs> When you, there we go. When you, when you when we run out of t-shirts, that's it. So I, I ordered 60. Should be enough, but we'll see. Um, probably don't need five. Too bad. All right. So what's a Bohemian eigenvalue? Uh, where is my little control here? Maybe I just page down. I don't see a page down. There we go. Um, before I talk about Bohemian eigenvalues, I should say that this is related to a, a, a earlier ideas. Uh, the earlier, the first I saw of it was the pictures by Peter Borwick, John's brother, and Loki Jurgensen in their paper, uh, Visible Structures in Number Theory. But the first pictures were created in 1995. Uh, at the same year that I was on sabbatical at John's Center for Experimental and Constructive Mathematics, uh, I chiefly remember Loki for jumping over a couch to run to the server when the servers failed. He was also managing the, the lab at the time. That was the time that he had to do that. Anyway, that's, that's a real IT manager. Uh, Peter and Christopher Pinner published a paper shortly after that. Uh, Loki and uh, Peter Pinner didn't appear until 2001, I don't think. Dan Christensen is here. Dan has on his website a whole bunch of interesting images related to this. So there's zeros of polynomials where the coefficients are bounded. So the original problem due to Littlewood, the coefficients were just plus or minus one, uh, generalizes it in an interesting way. In about 2004, 2007, I started working on polynomials expressed in Lagrange basis and found a way to find zeros directly without converting to uh, monomial basis. And that turned out to be a really interesting thing to do for a bunch of applied reasons. But I also thought at the time, oh, well, we can <coughs> repeat that plus minus one question in the Lagrange basis and get different pictures. So those were my first Bohemian eigenvalues because the, re the way I was finding the roots of the polynomials was by solving an eigenvalue problem. And in fact, you could do these ones by solving eigenvalue problems too. It's a little bit expensive to convert a, a polynomial uh, problem to an eigenvalue problem and find the eigenvalues to find the roots. But it's a very reliable way, and it's very easy if you've got eigenvalue software lying around. On John's slide about the top 10 algorithms, uh, number six was the QR algorithm by uh, Francis and Kulanskaya independently. Uh, and it really transformed the way eigenvalues are found. So it's actually a practical kind of thing to do. It was only relatively recently I, that I realized that the embedding of polynomial zeros problems into eigenvalue problems is one way. I can give you a, a collection of matrices where the entries of the matrix are bounded height, but the coefficients in the characters of the polynomial are not. So uh, Eunice's poster tomorrow night uh, will talk about Fibonacci, no, Fibonacci number of polynomials, so you'll see another example of that. So that the uh, Elements are just zero and one in both of them, or zero and minus one actually, but the coefficients of p grow exponentially in the degree. This is also connected to the theory of random matrices, the spectra of random matrices, and that has a very deep history going at least back to Wisher. And Eugene Wigner is a Nobel Prize in Physics in 1963. Terence Tao is a fields medalist. Uh, Terence Tao and Van Vu have written a, a bunch of papers, or each this thick. Oh, speaking of this thick, my, my publisher says I must advertise my book at every talk. 
Okay, so if you don't know my book, please come and talk to me right afterwards, and I'll hit you over. No. Um, there will be a review in Siam Review, which I just have to read a little bit of it. The, Alex Thompson has written a review, and the pa opening paragraph says, I just finished the 1.7 kilogram book <laughs> by Corliss and Fillion. I read the book chapter by chapter, uh, uh, taking it with me as I traveled to three different countries. There's a footnote. The footnote says, um, Security control of the United States will search a backpack containing a copy of Corliss and Filiot because it is three inches thick. <laughs> and then one has to explain the peculiar character. Anyway, I love Alex for that. I don't care what the rest of the <laughs> says. Um, Terence Tao's papers are just about as thick as that. Uh, here's a, a new version of uh, Peter and Loki's picture. This is uh, uh, plus or minus one coefficient. So this is zeros of polynomials. And you see this amazing fractal structure appearing off the edges and gaps. So this is the original fascinating picture. Exploring not the, the asymptotic distribution for large n, but the intermediate size. This is also uh, polynomials, again from somewhere. My student, uh, uh, Stephen, found that. It's given the source on the bottom of that. Roots of all polynomials degree less than or equal to four. Similar kinds of pictures, but beginning to be a, a little bit weird because now the coefficients are bounded height, but not bounded by one, bounded by 30. And all positive, so it leads to some interesting asymmetries. Yeah, Charles, you can just sit right here, actually. This is a great place. Just okay, eigenvalues of random matrices are also well studied. We'll just skip over more of those things. Ah, I thought I was going to have a picture of an eigenvalue of a random matrix in that part. Anyway. We'll get to that. There's some interesting properties and differences between polynomials and matrices. So if I give you three by three matrices uh, whose entries are either minus one, zero, or one, then there are 19,683 different such matrices <coughs> because each of the uh, uh, nine entries can be chosen from three things. So you get three to the three squared. For a three by three system. For four by four, it's three to the four square. It's not exponential growth, it's super exponential growth. This is why eigenvalues of matrices with uh, coefficients of bounded height were investigated after <coughs> polynomials with uh, coefficients of bounded height because the growth here is quite a bit faster. What's number C, though? Number C is the number of different uh, characteristic polynomials of those matrices. So just because you start with a big matrix doesn't mean you're going to get, or with a lot of matrices, doesn't mean you're going to get a lot of eigenvalues. Because the eigenvalues of any given matrix are not determined by n squared numbers, but rather by n numbers, just the coefficients of the polynomial. It's a nonlinear compression to compute the characters of all of them in. But it's a quite significant compression. Two by two matrices with these three entries in it, there are 81 matrices, but only 16 different characteristic polynomials. 19,000, three by three, but only 209 different characteristic polynomials. I do not know how many different characteristic polynomials there are for four by four. Uh, neither does the online encyclopedia of integer sequences, which, was, which is absolutely my first Go to for that. Thank you very much, Neil. <laughs> well, yeah. Is that a fair count? Because you haven't looked at any you know, permutations or other things that would. You're, you're quite correct. There are, there are two, three main reasons why the, the, that compression works. One is that A and A transpose have the same characteristic polynomial. Another is A and P times A times P inverse, where P is any permutation of the rows, also, and that doesn't change the bounded height. There's more than that. Yeah. There's, because a lot of, and in fact, if I say I want to know what the bounds are on the possible character, the, the, uh, characteristic polynomials, 
I can get the bounds, but I can't get tight bounds because the the growth is different in these things. And in fact, it's a Diophantine equation to solve. So if, if I want to work with characteristic polynomials, I first have to find them, and that's, well, actually, just pretty much, as far as I know, just as hard as working with the matrices to start with. What's in this column is the number of characteristic polynomials with at least one multiple root. So we have 17 polynomials with at least one multiple root here. Uh, if instead of minus 1, 0, and 1, I have 0, 1, and 2, uh, the 1 by 1 matrices are pretty easy. We can do those ones. Uh, there are no multiple roots, 1 by 1 matrices. There are three, just, as, just exactly the same as for this collection of three things. But notice that there are more characteristic polynomials. That's because these items are somehow less correlated than these. So you get more symmetries based on the set. So that's another reason why it's hard to compute characters with polynomials, which is more relations. If instead I put in a symbol, t1 and 2, t might be uh, epsilon, a small number, then the number of characters with polynomials goes up again. There are no multiple, generically no multiple roots, because if t is equal to 0, we go back to 3. But generically, there are no multiple ones here. But at 3 by 3, there are. There are double roots at 1 plus t and 1 minus t. Some of those polynomials actually factor over the symbolic region. 1,782 different characteristic polynomials with that symbol in it. And this is just 3 by 3 uh, matrices with 3 entries in it. So this is just really tiny. Kind of situation. I have a question. 43 million doesn't seem that big. Wouldn't it be not that hard to compute them all? 43 million is not that hard, yes. And my student said, oh, when I put this table in, he said, oh, I, I, I've got a C++ program. I'll, I'll do that for you tomorrow if I have time. But he didn't. But that's OK. He's done so much for this. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm OK with that. I only recently started counting these things. I thought it would be a good idea for the talk. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we could do 43 million. We could probably get up to 5.5 as well. I would like to know that. Please get into do, do the next yeah, I, I will do that. I will. And because I want to know. <laughs> I want to know where these where these numbers come from. If you take the symmetries into account, it would probably help too, because then you have less cases. If we if we start with the symmetries and yes, but then the bookkeeping of doing that is well, let the computer do the work. I'm I'm happier letting the computer do the work, really. Um Here's a different set. Now we've only got two entries in the field. So now we can push it, push the counts a little bit higher even just on a tiny machine. So four by four with two entries in them, 65,000, the million number, 333 characteristic columns <coughs> with multiple roots. Uh, I might come back to that. This is a, a really interesting fact. Multiple roots, and this total number of cases, 512 uh, matrices, 150 of those matrices out of 512 have multiple eigenvalues. They're, they're repeated because it's the same one occurs several times. But still, multiplicity occurs rather more frequently than I would have guessed looking at. 500, generically things aren't well, multiple roots. But the law of large number, small numbers. The law of small numbers says this, this is going to happen more often. So we actually do have to care about this in the small uh, size case. Oh yes, I already mentioned this. There's a lots, of, lots of reasons for repeats. Uh, the main reason I use eigenvalue problems is I love eigenvalue. I'm a numerical analyst by, I would say, 40% inclination, 55% inclination. I'm a computer algebraist. Uh, the rest of it is in philosophy these days. I'm really happy about that. Um, how do I know when my computations are right? I really care about the computational epistemology. I mean, this is uh, part, of the, part of the discussion in this meeting. Anyway, eigenvalue computation always works. Henry Wolkowitz is not here. He would say, well, what about really, really, really large matrices? Okay, well, all right, fine. Uh, QR, 
iteration and its variants, QZ and other kinds of things, have been tested on billions and billions and billions of matrices. And it, it works. For these little problems, little tiny problems, degree three polynomials, I gave Maple a whole bunch of these characteristic polynomials. Actually, my student Sonia gave uh, Maple a whole bunch of these different characteristic polynomials, and we ran into a bug. Maple went, went away on cubic polynomials with complex coefficients, no t's or anything in there. Polynomial root finding is hard. Ah, okay, so lots of people in here have solved very large polynomials. I like brute force. When you've got enough computing power, uh, brute force has a quality all its own. Ah, oh, there's two by two matrices just to show you. Got lots of them. All right, two by two matrices. They're kind of interesting. Here's the eigenvalues of all two by two matrices uh, with entries minus one, zero, and one. And as you can see, we've got multiple eigenvalues at zero, and one is minus one, and the rest of them not so much. Nice pattern, but not particularly interesting. Symmetric, though. The three by three matrices, we already see some structure beginning to appear. And in particular, these exclusion regions are something that I'm quite interested in. I can explain that exclusion region. Kevin might be able to explain all of the, the, the big holes. Uh, Just use bigger dots. <laughs> <laughs> yes, or take or, or use bigger matrices because it, it does fill in as we take larger matrices. So four by fours, nice big holes there, but little funny holes over here, little stars. This is this is not a hole. It's, it's like an octopus got flattened out of my picture with only five arms or something. Other features begin to appear here too. We have lines coming in, spiraling in, in some ways. And for those of the algebraic number, people who do a lot of things with algebraic numbers, you might have plotted these for polynomials, but lots of roots of polynomials, you will have seen similar things. And of course, these eigenvalues are algebraic numbers. Because when we take the characteristic polynomial, the coefficients are in the so they are what they are. But they're different from bounded type ones. Uh, most of the big entry, but these ones were uh, images of all eigenvalues of these, these things. The images on the poster, the images on the, the cover of uh, uh, programs. Oh yeah, I could have, I could have held one, that, one of the programs up. Fine. So that one is not all eigenvalues of five by five matrices with entries. The entries are minus one, minus one twentieth, zero, one twentieth, and one. So a cluster around zero. We didn't do them all. Five by five with, with uh, five entries is way too much. That's five to the five squared. No, we're not going to do to compute all. So we sample, and I think it sampled about three billion matrices. And at three billion matrices, we probably got most of the characteristic polynomials. And the eigenvalues we missed were pretty improbable anyway. Okay. Unlikely would. So here is maybe the first image that I saw, and in some sense still my favorite. So minus one, zero, one, five by five, three billion matrices, about 0.35% of the class. There's 847 billion five by five matrices with entries minus one, zero, one. And as it, you cannot see the line of eigenvalues on the, on the real line, but there's a lot of real eigenvalues. The classical theorems, uh, Littlewood, Littlewood, who proved that the, the, gave the nice bounds of the number of real eigenvalues for. Uh, so I can, as I say, I can explain the gap around zero. There's a zero eigenvalues and then the nearest real non-zero eigenvalue must be at least a certain distance of so a nice bound. That's because the determinant is either zero or an integer. So the smallest it can be is one, so you have to have that jump there anyway. We now think we have a handle on why we have diffraction patterns coming up in there. And what determines your coloring? 
the taste of my graduate student. Uh, no, Stephen spent a lot of time to choose the colors so, so it did look nice and produce information. This is colored by density. So the, the brighter green, what's a brighter blue, is, corresponds to a greater density number of uh, times the eigenvalue occurs. So, so yes, we, we can remember see. when we colored the original pictures, there were certain measures of stability yes. that introduced artifacts. This one is colored by condition number. And the very, very red dots in the middle, those are the, the uh, most but sensitive. To they appear to be kind of robust colorings. Yes. Uh, you can kick the matrices and the red dot will move a little bit, actually expand a little bit. Pseudospectra are really interesting to me for a whole bunch of reasons and we really do want to pursue that. Okay. Okay. Well, if yep. these are diffraction patterns, what are they, did you try looking to see what they're the diffraction pattern of? No. I. I this is, this is, we're in its infancy right at home. We're in the discovery phase, so thank you. That's, a, that's an excellent thing to pursue. So that's a, an inverse scattering kind of, I want to find out. Yeah, I'd like to know. Now I, now I do too. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Because <laughs> uh, this is the same kind of phenomenon in, in a totally different context. So, yeah. Which is what the encyclopedia is designed to, to to find, and I was hoping some physicist that no, anyway. <laughs> uh, we're back to algebraic numbers here. This is somebody on map pictures and, and Reddit. Uh, and we see some of these arcs and structures. So the, some of the pictures, some of the, the features of these eigenvalue problems are inherent in the algebraic number nature of the, of the beast that we're looking at. And we zoom in, and here we see the diffraction pattern coming in. So this is a picture of polynomials, but you can see that some of these lines come right in here, others stop sooner, and anything that comes in towards the center and stops, and then something stops out farther, well, the gaps between the lines must be largest just before so the gaps in, in these lines are, are largest just, just before the new ones come in. And what the eye sees is the gap. So I think that what we're seeing in the diffraction pattern is exactly that kind of thing. But as to the detailed explanation of why the things stop where they do, I don't know. There we go. Oh, when I said minus one, minus 120th, zero, one, uh, one twentieth and one, I lie. It's really minus 20, one, zero, minus one, 20. Oh, that's the same thing, scale the matrix by 20. Uh, ah, and I lied about the color by condition number. This is also colored by density. So there are many, many more eigenvalues in there. This, these structures are real. They, this looks like fuzzy, pixel kinds of things on there. If you zoom in, oh, you get solid blocks coming out. These matrices are small enough that, except for the multiple eigenvalue case, we can get 16 digits of accuracy. And it turns out that the multiple eigenvalues don't bother us that much, even for five by five, except in extremely rare cases. Here's a really bizarre one. Instead of minus 120th, zero, and 120th, we make minus 1 over 10,000, 0 and 1 over 10,000, and now we get crazy structures in the middle. Zoom in on that. And this is, these are not numerical artifacts. We know they're not numerical artifacts. Is it, all these specific computations are done at double precision, ordinary double precision, but uh, that's accurate enough. That's accurate enough so that we know that all of these stripes and colors and all that are just absolutely spot on. And I have no idea why <laughs> this is the next to me that it does. Um, I'm actually going to stop now. Could you just teasing. Well, the page up works. Yes. And it's pretty clear that this is just a translation suite. You know, that's, that's no so problem. The question is, yeah, all those little 
Are they, are they also similar to that symptom? If, if you zoom in, they're, trans, they're transformed. But yes, you get similar structures with, the, with similar symptoms. Well, that's, that's inferred or imputed or proved. Um, this raises the question of the standard of proof. Uh, I, I was once at a conference on dynamical systems and statistics and computation where Henry of Arbonnel, a physicist, said at the start of his talk, he said, I have absolutely no interest in proving things that I know are true. <laughs> we, uh, uh, all the physicists said, yeah, uh, all the mathematicians went. <laughs> <laughs> so while I'm perfectly confident in the, uh, the numbers because I trained in numerical analysis, I actually had all the theorems about eigenvalue stability, to, I do not know what the relationship between this thing and this thing yet. It's, it's not quite a trans, it's not, really, well that one might be translation, but these ones well, are not. That's, that's the case also maybe with the, man, the standard Mandelbrot set, yeah. is that the, the, all these little satellites are not really, they're rotations and, and squished and squeal, yeah. and squeezed and... You'll see some more ideas. very striking as well. Yeah. I, I, I do think that as a community we need to be careful to keep emphasizing what we've discovered, what the yes. evidence is, You're and right. it's That was an excellent question and exactly the right thing to say. So what I've proved in the, in the sense of real honest to goodness proof is that real gap between zero and the, the nearest real eigenvalue. It's not a very profound proof, but it is a real. Uh, the other things that I proved are the accuracy of the results that we see. I'm, I'm not going to end on the on the weirdo picture. I'm going to end on a picture of matrices that are complex symmetric. How many of you have ever used a complex symmetric matrix? Hit one, two. Okay. They're rare in general literature, but they're actually quite useful in a bunch of ways. I really like them because they produce astonishing pictures. Okay. Thank you very much.